the level of discussion that's been going on and but the difficulty of that uh, our staff has had in sweeping people back to Is that the variance? That's yeah. a great problem to have. Table. And um, I thank you for the work that you put into those discussions and uh, the ideas that you put forward. Uh, we will be synthesizing those ideas and I will be presenting uh, kind of the top three that came forward from each of the sessions uh, immediately following our closing uh, um, <laughs> thank you for the people who are trying to bring them into order. It's a big challenge. Um, I want to just uh, share with you very, very quickly uh, a little bit about, people have been asking, uh, we're going to learn more about what uh, Tecnici is all about and what are you doing to capture some of uh, what we talked about here today. So there's already been a lot of activity and a lot of content uh, on IT World Canada, or sorry, on ITBusiness.ca uh, that's showcasing uh, some of the information that you're seeing on stage today. Uh, if, uh, just some of the examples of things you might like to look at. We have uh, a slideshow put together of uh, some of the more famous people from the Toronto area who have gone on to work at some of the larger companies uh, in technology in the world to talk about uh, what they uh, learned and benefited from from starting out in Toronto and some of their advice uh, to the industry back at home. We have an interactive map that looks at some of the other major uh, tech centers uh, around the world. If you click on the dots in those maps, you'll see uh, advice that we uh, managed to get from experts on what Toronto can learn from those various communities. Uh, we have infographics that are displaying some of the research from the Toronto Area Regional Research Alliance and their most recent report, which some of you are already may have seen uh, or received. And of course, we'll be doing lots of stories, lots of video about uh, all the sessions and some of the key uh, speakers that you've been hearing here today, including our, our next speaker. Uh, when you talk about, we talk a lot about community at, at this event, but uh, I think a, a great example of community actually happened uh, back, uh, I believe it was around 2004. So imagine that you're a startup and you want to get your product noticed. And then imagine if there was more than 10,000 people who were willing to help you get that message out there. Well, in 2004, that's what happened when a bunch of people saw what was happening at the Mozilla Foundation. They heard about this new browser called Firefox, and they all donated enough money to get an ad, a two-page spread, in the New York Times talking about why this product was important and why they believed in it. It's kind of an interesting story because it's hard to imagine in 2011 people seeing a newspaper page in the New York Times as being a key uh, driver of a, of a marketing message that probably would look very uh, uh, different today. But what I think is true is the popularity of Mozilla and the, the great passion within their user base. The, the browsers continue to develop in features and functionality, but also has incurred a great amount of loyalty that I think is probably an inspiration for uh, a lot of startups here. To talk a little bit more about that in the Mozilla Foundation, we have its executive director, Mark Sermon. Uh, he has worked in terms of offering community-oriented uh, strategies with the federal government, with the province of Ontario, with the, the Canadian uh, Labour Congress. Uh, he is also the author of two books, and he has uh, done all kinds of speeches like these in more than 40 countries, but he got his start here at the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Arts in the History of Community Media. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Sarr. Is there anything today? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, I am happy to meet all of you who are new and interesting to me, and I really wish I'd been here for the, the whole day. It's a, a topic that is really passionate to me. Um, and what I really want to talk about, well, actually, I, I, I did talk to a couple of you, and, and one person who I talked to as I came in, I said, what, what's this about? He kind of gave me a bunch of the, this and that cluster stuff and, you know, building talent stuff, but then, you know, I, we kind of really pushed the conversation. And he said, really what people are talking about is how do we make Toronto like Venice in the Renaissance? How do we make Toronto the place that people want to be and where the new ideas pop up? Um, so that is, in fact, one of my favorite topics, both that creativity and innovation and Toronto. Uh, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to talk, talk much at all about Mozilla. Um, but I want to talk about that in a way you probably haven't spent much time on today. I want to talk about how you create a Toronto that is like Venice in the Renaissance to our kids. Um, but before that, uh, let me kind of engage that broader theme of, of technology and talent. And I guess, you know, why Mozilla cares about that theme. Well, actually, let's just see if you know anything about Mozilla. So how many people uh, use Firefox or have once used Firefox? Uh, how many people use Chrome now? 
You know, that's awesome. That's fine. That's a part of our victory, too. Um, that's a, a different speech. But really, we exist because we want the web to be an open resource for all of us. And, and the fact that are now the, the two biggest browsers after IE are both open source browsers, but more importantly, both driving standards as the basis of industry and creativity on the web, that is victory, and that's what we exist for and stand for. And in behind all of that, and some of the stuff we're, we're focused on today, which goes beyond Firefox, we're moving a lot into the, the mobile web app space, really trying to do what we can to disrupt Android and, and iOS, and we're also moving a lot into to learning and education. And the, the thing that actually underpins why we cared about the browser in the first place is that the internet and the web in particular began as a place where people came to make stuff and really embraced kind of joyously the spirit of being a maker. And really Mozilla's mission, you know, more deeply and personally than keeping the web open, is helping people move from using the web to making the web. And I think that's key to this idea of Toronto as being like Venice in, in the Renaissance. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, because it's, a, it's becoming a bigger part of our focus. Um, so that's why we care about that, that topic, is we actually care about what the web is, which is at the center of, of these ideas around innovation. And I guess, you know, why do I care? Um, I care because I live here. Uh, and I've talked a lot about Toronto and innovation over the years. And I came from here. I went to University of Toronto. Um, and I live in High Park. But I, you know, I also care because I run an organization here that I would rather see grow more of its employees and more of its community in Toronto than some of the other places around the world. We have offices in you know all the places that Toronto likes to see as its competitors in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and London and Berlin and blah blah Beijing and Tokyo and all these places. And personally, as an individual and a leader in the organization, I think of it as a Toronto as a place where I want to grow uh, our organization. And unlike a lot of, of other organizations that are here, um, we really actually have this as a base of engineering and invention, is not a, a marketing and sales office for Mozilla. So I care about Toronto because I want to make Mozilla bigger here. Um, but I, you know, I'm here personally because I do care about what the city is 50 years from now. I care about the long view of Toronto as a place that's going to be remembered as a center of innovation. And I think we can do that. I thought that for a long time, and I see hints of that. But I actually don't see us going far and fast enough. So, so I want to dig into that because it is the, the topic of today. And you know, there's, there's a bunch of ways you could dig into that. Um, you know, one of the most obvious ones uh, is to kind of dig into the question of ambition. Uh, and I certainly think we've got far too low a level of ambition at Toronto around technology. You know, we talk about attracting companies like Google. We need to be the place where the next Google comes from. Not where we just kind of flip a company and sell it to Silicon Valley. We can be a place where there are companies that change the world. And our ambition is low, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we also, you know, another thing you could talk about is diasporas. And actually, I don't know if people have seen The Economist this week. It's my favorite cover of The Economist all week year, which is saying a lot, because Protestant has been pretty, pretty entertaining this year. Um, but this is, a, you know, the, the cover this year is The Magic of Diasporas, and how the companies and the, the economies that actually are thriving in this world of debt crisis really are those ones that galvanize the connections between people living outside of their own countries. That those global economies among individuals, amongst immigrants, actually are a really key part of, you know, from, from kind of remittances through to people working and running companies across national boundaries with the, the people they grew up with. Huge part of global economic growth. And Toronto could be the place that develops the next Google because the next Google will be one that taps into those global diaspora. But I don't want to talk about that, although it's an opportunity for us. And then, of course, you know, the other easy thing to talk about if we want to talk about you know, Toronto becoming a real center for technology is to talk about our universities and our, our colleges. Uh, and you'll, if people have followed me, you'll know that I actually am a huge believer in Canadian Canada's community college system as potentially the base for a revolution in how we teach technology. The people we work with at Seneca College blow away anybody uh, I've worked with in the world and, and frankly blow away our universities in terms of the innovation and how they teach computer science. And so we could talk about that. That would be another whole talk. But I'm not going to talk about that. 
And the reason I'm going to talk about those things is because what really, to me, increasingly matters about where innovation goes, where the web goes, and where I see hope is kids. And I've got a, a nine-year-old and a, and a twelve-year-old, and you know they get the internet better than any of you, and they certainly get the internet better than me. They know what it's for, and they know what it's about. But you know, at the same time, you know what they're growing up on. You know, it's kind of famous that this is now the best baby toy on the planet, right? Is that you hand this to a kid and they know how it works, but they actually don't. They don't know how it works in the way that all of us do, because it's kind of shiny and hard to get inside. And that's something that, as much as I'm hopeful about our kids being the thing that will turn Toronto into Renaissance Venice, uh, I'm also a little bit worried because when we all grew up, I'll just talk about me. Um, when I all grew up, uh, the you know it was kind of with a lot of punk rock and DIY and ethic. Maybe that's about everybody in here. But I also grew up with that beautiful sound, almost as beautiful as punk rock. Does everybody remember the sound of the modem connecting? <laughs> <laughs> and remember how often it failed? Like it would dial, it would dial, and trying to connect. And then you remember the first time you installed Mosaic or Netscape, right? These rudimentary web browsers were like a revelation. Look, there's pictures on a computer screen from across the internet. And, and you know, maybe there's some people younger than me here who don't remember that. But that was like how, you know, myself and frankly everybody who is running an important tech company in the world first experienced the internet. And it's very different than this, right? It's very different than this. Because what it invited, what it forced us to do, was understand the mechanics of what was going on. It forced us and invited us to like go and view source because why isn't that image loading? Or go and view source because I'm making my first website. It's not really that different than writing a document in Word Perfect Five anyways, uh, and stealing a piece of code from somebody else's web page, you know, so I could make the blank tag work in my web page and all of those kind of things. We were invited to look under the hood. We were forced to look under the hood because it was hard. Um, and the hardness, we all wanted to connect with each other so much we put up with it and we learned a lot. And so, you know, when I talk about uh, this sort of, you know, the, the, what I increasingly call the web maker spirit, uh, that ethos that the web is a place where I can just express myself and play and the technology is something that I, I understand I can manipulate and change, I worry a lot uh, that these are taking that away. And as much as our kids get what the internet is for, they don't get how it works. And that's a problem if, if what you want to do is create vibrant tech companies or even people who work in tech companies. Because as I said, all the people who are leading any of the tech companies you care about grew up with that whiny moto sound. And they grew up with Mosaic and Netscape. And they grew up with a web that they could easily and intuitively pull apart. And they did. And then they built stuff. And so, you know, the, the, the thing that I'm increasingly interested in is how do we actually re-engage that ethos of web making? And imagine that those skills of pulling things apart and expecting the internet to be something I can open up and play with and manipulate are actually the expectations of our children and also are the formation of the skill set of our children both the technical skill set, the ability to understand the mechanics of the internet uh, and make things out of code, and the ethos of the internet that I can take building blocks from other places and put them together. Those are the things that great tech companies are built from. Those are things we want to bring back to our children. So I, I'm supposed to have some stuff on a screen. See, put the lights in the for you. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I think Toronto needs to do, but I also think the world needs to do, increasingly what I, I want Mozilla to focus on is how we do that. How we talk to kids in a way that brings back that web maker ethos because they're going to be the ones who lead and work at and run the companies that are going to make this an awesome city. And so let me, I'm just going to show you a video um, and talk about one tiny thing that we're doing. This is my son Tristan. Um, and what Tristan is doing is um, 
He's using something that a little simple thing that we've done to help kids tinker with the web called Hackasaurus. And what Hackasaurus is is basically a, a really easy way. Oh, let me get the out of there for you to see what are the elements of a web page. So without going view source, it's easy to see that's an image tag. Um, and now what he's doing is saying, I don't actually like that web page. No offense to Google, I love you. Um, but you know, he hits the remix button, which is just this works in any browser. It works in Chrome. It works in IE. Uh, and he says, I just want to kind of play with this page. Just a local copy. He's, you know, just play around. So he takes his logo for his gaming website that he runs. He's, he's 12. Uh, and he throws it in there. And all of a sudden, he's got his own new version of that page. And so in a very simple set, step, he's kind of said, oh, the internet's something I can change. And what we've also built into this is the fact that, like, say he thought that was really cool, because he does, and kids do. Uh, he can easily share a Flickr picture or a screen capture of that because it's not, he hasn't actually hacked a website. He's just actually done something cool, which is like what kids like to do on the web. Um, of course, what we do let him do then as a third step is, as in the tradition of view source, which is basically the, the, the basis of innovation, we wouldn't have the internet we have if it wasn't for view source and people copying HTML code. Um, you know, what he's able to do is pull that page that he edited into Etherpad and make his own version. Uh, and so he's now actually going to take one of his videos from YouTube, he's going to pull the iframe embed code, um, and this is, he does these, I don't know if people watch uh, video game commentator kids, but it's like the most awesome medium phenomena ever if you don't know what's going on. Uh, with that. It's one of the reasons to say kids know what's going on and we don't. They don't watch television, they watch each other talk over video games really bizarre stuff. But anyways, he's able to take that and throw that then into his copy of that web page and now he's got a website. And you know why we did that and why, why um, actually the, the really cool thing why I made this video, I have it on my laptop, I just decided the last time to show it, um, is that um, Tristan actually came and, and did a, a Hacksaurus workshop, ran a Hacksaurus workshop at TEDx Kids in Brussels earlier this year. Um, so it's an easy thing to do and, and to teach. So anyways, why, why I'm telling you about this and why we did this is kids don't know what a URL is. Right? When we go out and we work with kids, they don't understand the basic mechanics of the internet. You know, they, they understand uh, you know, this or they understand YouTube. It's not bad, right? I love my tablet and I love YouTube. But it's not the mechanics and the logic of the internet upon which we have built these companies like Google and Facebook or organizations and nonprofits like Mozilla. It's that basis of a, a web making ethos that those things are built on. And kids, especially kind of mainstream kids who don't want to be geeks, they you know they're not exposed to it. So the idea of hack source is just to find a thing that kids can do that's fun, that exploits what they're already doing, which is sharing nifty stuff for them. Uh, you know, stuff they think is nifty, but does it in a way that exposes the mechanics of the web to them. And this is the first step in that. We, we were finding that actually a lot since this video uh, was made. But we believe, and, and this is one thing that needs to happen amongst thousands, we believe that what we need to do is reach out to kids to help them discover the basic mechanics of the web, help some of them move on to become coders, because that is the basis of the skills they're going to need to lead these companies and also the skills that we're going to want them to have to keep the internet an open and free resource, which is the basis of all the wealth and creativity that we have created through these companies. So um, another thing I just want to talk about is a little bigger than Hacksaurus, although Hacksaurus is you know, picking up all over the place. It was just a, a hack, what we call a hack jam, where you come and demo the software for some kid. Somebody just organized one in Nairobi out of the blue last week. Um, so this stuff is picking up. But another thing we're doing, just to kind of talk a little bit about maybe being systematic about reaching out to kids and helping them tap into this uh, web maker ethos, um, is something that you know, we call the High Learning Network in New York. Uh, and you know, I always love to show New York because you know, Toronto always wants to kick New York's ass. Um, and, and there's no reason that we, we shouldn't be able to do that. And this is going to give you an opportunity to think about that towards the end. So what High Learning Network New York City is, basically a bunch of people who share that same idea in some way, 
that I just talked about. That it's important to and useful uh, to remove kids from using the web to making the web. But what's interesting about this is it's it's a group of organizations, and actually let me just scroll here. You know, we kind of have just help them do some teaching around the web, which includes everybody from the American Museum of Natural History. I don't know if you've ever been there on the, the west side of Central Park, huge old old lady of a, of a museum, beautiful, big, big building, through to, you know, if you look up there in the, the top of the Bronx, Dream Yard, a place that teaches art, uh, you know, arts in the schools in the poorest congr congressional district in the U.S., you know, through to folks down in Brooklyn who are, you know, teaching kids explicitly about computers. And there's, there's 40 of these groups we work with, well, groups, I mean, some of them are big institutions. And what all of them have in common, what the hide is, is all of them embedding that idea of making things through technology and how they teach whatever they teach. So we go to the science workshops, doing data visualizations from data they've collected out with phones inside of Central Park. If you go to Dream Yard, you're going to see kids making art and poetry projects, but at the same time, picking up a bunch of web development skills. And why that's interesting is all of those institutions uh, not only do they have awesome educators and awesome physical premises, many of them, uh, and budgets for education, all of them want technology to be more central to how they teach whatever they teach. And instead of going and setting up a bunch of computer labs where you take nice photos of kids sitting in rows, what they've done is said, you know, we're creative participatory educators. You know, let's actually put this stuff in in a way that uses technology how kids use it. And where we've come in is we've backed in the how do you use the technology part. And why I talk to you about that in relationship to the Hive stuff is what happens when we back in the how do you use technology part is that kids are learning how to make things on the web even if that's what they signed up for. And that's what happened when we heard the modem screeching. Whether we were out there to connect with other people who were knitting or out there to connect with other people who were gaming, the surface of the web as something we could manipulate was put there in front of us as something that was understandable. We saw the mechanics and if we wanted to, we could manipulate it and change it and grow something from it and gain more skills and even build a company out of it. So what we're doing with Hive is we've got 40 institutions and we actually have built a, a, a fund which is now at almost $2 million a year inside of what's called the New York Community Trust, um, like the Toronto Community Foundation which helps them do curriculum development, all of, of our partner organizations in the Hive. And they are teaching what they teach better. They are getting more and more excited kids. So more kids and more excited kids. And we are teaching those kids to be web makers. And why I, I talk about that is, I think, and when I talk to some, some people, the people who run New York City Tech Meetup, uh, who are you know, the leaders in that, you know, is it, or New York becoming a real center place of the next phase of technology company development, um, they see that that is key resource. I mean, at some, at some well, maybe on a shallow level, at some very mechanistic levels, like, yeah, if I wanted to move to New York and I'm a geek, there's cool stuff for my kid to do. But more in the sense that there are kids who are turned on to technology who will want to learn to code, or who will become artists or designers or writers, but understand how code works and things, and that that is the long-term kind of talent pool that you need to build the kind of companies and the kind of tech economy um, that we're talking about. And so, you know, I, I show that stuff to you because I think it's different than the conversations you've probably already had today. Conversations about you know universities and how they put out talent, or conversations about how we engage our diaspora communities, or conversations about what kind of companies we want to build. Um, and I think all those things are important, but I actually think this is more important. I think that what we do with kids, with Tristan, like Tristan, are more important because that is going to give us the depth that we need in order to build the kind of companies we're talking about. And you know. I don't know, maybe there's other stuff I don't know about, but when I talk to my nine-year-old about, you know, they have some computers in the classroom. He goes to, he goes to Howard Public School in High Park. So, you know, when I talk to him about what kind of internet training they've got, where's the internet in the public school system, which by the way, I think isn't necessarily the best channel for this, why we work with museums and libraries and cultural organizations in the first place. 
Um, but you know, I, I love the school system also, but I ask you, what's the internet curriculum that they've had? What do you learn about the internet this year even? The only people who come and talk to him in the last two years about the internet, maybe three years, uh, are the police. <laughs> because how we teach the internet to kids is to teach them to fear it. Their experience of the internet is this shiny box, increasingly, and we're not going to build the companies we want to build, and we're not going to have the people with the skills we want, if that's how we start out talking to them about the internet. And if we do, it'll be despite us that they get there. The idea that and so kids are a key part of what we want to do if we want to build this city or the world is something that thrives in the kind of digital creativity we've seen in the last 15 years. And I think we don't do that, we're going to go back to the kind of boring centralized innovation economy that we spent the industrial era with. And maybe that sounds harsh or wrong or you know, the sky is falling, but I actually think if we don't think about how our kids think about technology, that's what we're going to get. And Toronto will not fare well with that. So, you know, I, I'm committing a lot to that. Um, there's, Concrete things are doing well beyond uh, what I'm talking about here. These are sort of some, some drops in the bucket. But I guess you know it's not that hard, and you don't need to join us in order to contribute to this. So what you know what I would say is I want you to commit, or at least consider, what can you do for the kids around you to help them understand that the web is something they can play with and tinker with and use in the way that many of us in this room have. And if you want to go further than that. I would actually love to have a map that is better than this in Toronto. We built this in New York in less than two years. And it didn't start with a lot of money. It started with maybe, I mean, this was a little bit before we came on the scene and came to work with you afterwards. You know, it started with maybe $100,000, $200,000 and a, a bunch of kind of crazy idealists and has grown into something that's got $2 million a year aggregated in a community foundation doing curriculum and some of the world's biggest cultural industry brands, or kind of cultural institution brands, as well as some of the coolest innovators on the ground in teaching technology. And so I invite you all, and encourage you all, to do what you can, just to reach out to kids, help them play with the web, uh, whether it's just showing them view source or using something like hack source. But if there was interest, I'd also be happy to work with you all to make that map better in Toronto. And uh, that's all I have to say, although I, I did leave time for questions. And if you want to talk to me, that's me. So, questions. Those who are the floor line. Or tomato. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, excellent talk. Is there, is there a place, so I've got, I've got a five and a half year old, and is there a, a place, uh, a library, a museum here in Toronto that uh, we yeah. can go to that, that you nothing? Not that I know about. So there are some really talented tech youth educators, and I know some of them. But you know, I unfortunately spend a lot of time on airplanes, and I would love to see more of those things in Toronto. I, I, and I think we've, we've got a great city to build it. Excuse me, you said that you weren't going to talk about Seneca, but they do an absolutely superb job. Where can you it? can you give us one minute even, like why is Seneca so phenomenal? Oh, okay. Well, that, it, is, it may be hard for me to get in because I will wax prophetic. But, um, you know, the short answer is there's a couple professors, three or four now at Seneca, um, who understand how people work collaboratively globally to make people software. Uh, and most people teach computing haven't actually been out there in the world doing that. Or if they have, they don't exist in a curriculum environment that says that's what's important. And, and well, don't get me off on tenure and research and all that stuff. But anyways, uh, you know, so you've got a couple of professors who basically look at how people like Mozilla, but also people like Microsoft and IBM create software, which is a global distributed environment where people live in IRC, where people peer review each other's code. Like, that's how we make software, right? That's how we ship software. And what those professors do is they don't teach. They take their kids, they give them a boot camp on whatever technology, they work with Clips, which is another open source project, they work with Red Hat, which is a Linux distribution, they work with us. And they don't teach, they throw the kids onto a boat. 
They throw each of the kids, 30 kids for a semester, out there into an environment where there are real engineers, some of them volunteers, some of them pay, and they work on real code. And some of them get their, just like happens in a real open source project, some of them get their code checked into the final product, and lots of them don't, because that's how people make software. And so the, 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 the fact that they use the kind of peer environment and community of a software project like Mozilla or Red Hat or Eclipse as a teaching environment and our facilitators helping kids get the right bug at their own level of competency, they produce amazing outcomes in terms of these kids getting hired. But more importantly, these are kids who understand the nuances of how software is actually created. And if anybody, well, lots of people should hire engineers, I'm sure. You know, when you know, when you're hiring engineers, you're looking for those soft skills. Do they know how to work with people? Do they know how to collaborate? Do they know how to figure out how to talk across time zones? These kids come out of college not only knowing that, but many of them have shipped product in that environment. And the, the other thing, so I think that's an awesome way to teach, and we see great results. We also get them really involved in some of our cutting edge products that don't necessarily have enough resources behind them, and they've helped us um, ship a lot of really cool stuff. If you'd like to uh, learn a bit more and see some of those Seneca students, we just did a, a video on activists.ca where we interviewed a whole series of them about their aspirations and why they see this as important. So uh, just uh, type Seneca into the search bar on activists.ca and uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, there was another question in a right here somewhere, and I think I inadvertently cut somebody off. Uh, is there another question from Mark? Oh, so a popular table. So, Mark, in terms of uh, addressing parents, are there any organizations? Thank you. So, in terms of addressing parents, are there any organizations that you're aware of that uh, proactively educate parents on how to use the web for their children? And the reason I'm bringing this, this up is that I live in Markham, and um, I find it a little bit surprising that the Markham Economist has been writing now for the past few days about a group uh, of parents that are anti-Wi-Fi, you know, saying that it's going to have, you know, uh, this effect and that effect on children. So when there are parents that are against the internet and against Wi-Fi, then how can you, how, how can you help parents kind of educate themselves so that they in turn can educate children? Yeah, so I mean, that, that particular issue is kind of shocking to me. Um, the, the, the best group on that, although I, I have a bunch of differences of opinion on it. So, actually, I guess the thing I would say is there's not a group that does exactly that. I think it's one of the things I want Mozilla to learn, lean more towards is talk to people in general about how to think about the internet. And we don't really, we have some early things we're doing, like what I've shown you, which are kind of finding our skin in terms of doing that, but I think there's a role for, for that. And we would be happy to help do that and organize parents who want to talk to their parents, all of that. So, there is one group that we've started to work with who I, I like a lot, although they, they're a little bit, it's, it's hard to find parent groups that aren't, frankly, in playing into a little bit of the fear quotient. So even the best groups, they're not trying to do that, but there's just so much of that out there in this conversation. Um, but the, the group I like the best is a group called Common Sense Media, and they started out as helping parents and kids have conversations about what's appropriate content, both on the web and, and films and TV. And they started to move into kind of just understanding digital literacy and digital citizenship uh, with kids. So I, I think they're the best. Uh, we work with them, and I think one of the reasons we work with them is we also want to see ourselves and, and others fill that gap. Common sense media, it's they're out of San Francisco. I don't, I don't think there's a very big Canadian scene in this stuff. So. Any last questions? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, so there's one here, and then we'll. Uh, with, uh, I, th I think you're running a self-help session here for parents. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is actually an extension of the question over here. I have uh, uh, twin boys and they're 17 and they're actually part of that uh, iPad generation. They use it really well but they don't know anything about coding so can you for the Toronto area, just maybe throw some resources where they can perhaps go and start to learn some basic coding? Sadly, no. And, and I would say, so these are all things that I think we should build. Um, and I, 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 maybe there's stuff I don't know about, but it really is astounding 
even, I mean, I, I've looked all over the place. There isn't that much stuff. And the, the stuff that, um, that I've seen, the stuff I like, is really still new. Um, aiming at kids in COVID. It, it's shocking. Um, but th there just isn't. And, and so that's, you know, the Hackasaurus stuff is meant to be a bit of an on ramp. We'll add JavaScript stuff in there um, this year, uh, you know, to try to go in that direction. And the stuff that is out there is very small scale. So Google does a kind of a summer camp entrepreneurship thing where they fly kids from across the state. It's like 60 kids. Uh, there's this thing called Code Now in DC, awesome people, um, and they're just getting started. They want to get to four cities next year, but that's four cities doing a couple hundred kids a year. Like the, the need for this stuff is huge. It's, I mean, it's why I don't have the answers, but I know we need to focus on this, and we really want to reach out to people who, who want to work with that stuff. Um, and it is why I put my Twitter idea there, because if, if you want to talk about doing some of this stuff in Toronto, I'd be happy to like throw a beer night and just talk to people sometime probably in the new year just about what we could get going here. Because I don't think it's that hard, and I think it's a, a huge gap. I could probably do one more quick question. There's any other parents who need some help? Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, I think a lot of people try to do uh, community in various ways, but I think a lot of times the emphasis is more on soliciting for people and not as much contributing. Uh, I think your being here is a huge contribution. Uh, as you might see it in uh, Mark's uh, Twitter description, uh, he has himself down as a community nut. Uh, thank you, Mark, for inspiring a whole new generation of community nuts that take us to 2011. Thank you. Thanks very much. So uh, we are we're rapidly coming to the end, but an important part of this is to talk about what you talked about in the think tank session.